Welcome to the Galloway Show, More Man Pop Television, just me and Gayatri in our back room with one camera and one microphone. And yet, last week, again, it reached half a million. That's some audience for a midweek show with no budget at all. And that proves that we are right to bring back the midweek extra mother of all talk shows, which begins, God willing, on the 12th of October. Bookmark it now. Wednesday, the 12th of October, we will relaunch the midweek show because, frankly, events move at such a pace that once a week on a Sunday just isn't enough. I hope you agree. The audience numbers seem to suggest. Now, lean in for the nuggets. I need your support in a fighting fund to relaunch that midweek moat. So, as we're on YouTube exclusively, the way to do it is through the super chat mechanism. I'm not going to mention this again because begging for money is demeaning for me. It's not my 40 and it doesn't even work. There are thousands of people watching this right now who've never given a thin dime towards the relaunch of the midweek show. There are also a few hundred people who have given regularly and even generously regularly, and my hat metaphorically comes off to them. So I'm not going to mention it again. If you want to see the midweek moats take off and go into orbit rather than go up like a rocket and come back down again like a burnt stick, please give as much as you can on the Super Chat mechanism. You can also go to moats.tv and go to the donate button there. As you see, I'm wearing my black tie again. I extend my sympathies once again to all those that are grieving the passing of the 96-year-old monarch, monarch for 70 years, Queen Elizabeth II. Now, I have never said a bad word personally against Queen Elizabeth II, and I don't intend to start now even though I'm sorely tempted now that the tidal wave of guff has engulfed most of the country in rewriting history and placing a halo where no halo should exist. I regard the Queen of Heaven as Mary. I regard the King as Jesus. I bow to no man, only to God. And therefore, I'm against monarchy as a system. It makes no sense in the 21st century, coming to the end of the first quarter of the 21st century, to have a hereditary monarchy. That would be true even if the House of Windsor was an unalloyed paragon of virtue. But it is not. And the news today that when Charles is out of the country or absent from work for any other reason, that Prince Andrew will be the next in charge, the next in line, is simply unconscionable. It's inexplicable. It is unspeakable. Prince Andrew is a man whose face should never be seen in public life again. I thought that was common currency. I thought that was agreed when 12 million pounds of our common currency was used by the Queen to buy off a woman that Prince Andrew maintained on the state broadcaster BBC he had never even met. So let me run that past you again. 12 million pounds of our money, because all of the Queen's money is our money, we gave it to her. £12 million of our money was given to a girl that Prince Andrew had never met for something that he had never done. Something wrong there, isn't there? Even on the facts as we know them, never mind the speculation, Prince Andrew's close association with the disgraced child trafficking paedophile Jeffrey Epstein ought to be enough to disqualify him from polite company, certainly from royal balconies. 
certainly from royal duties, certainly from being second in line in the monarchy. I don't have a high opinion of any of them except Princess Anne. If there had been a vote on who should be the stand-in or even who should have succeeded Her Majesty the Queen, my vote would have gone for Princess Anne. But of course, uh, the Monty Python sketch notwithstanding, we don't get to vote for who is to be the king. That is, in fact, the point. Now, as I say, even if King Charles was an Olympian model of virtue, even if he was the very modicum of constitutional monarch, I would not be so hot under the collar. But he isn't any of these things. Those who care about women, those who care about wronged wives, will care a great deal about how then Prince Charles treated Princess Diana. I would argue that he drove her to an early grave, and it's a wonder that either of his sons want anything to do with them, except only one of them wants nothing to do with them. And that soap opera of Harry and Meghan and William and Kate is so tiresome, childish. It's like a Portuguese-Brazilian novella, except not nearly as interesting. The truth is that Charles is a cat, a bounder, much like Boris Johnson. In fact, he spent his life doing many of the things that Boris Johnson did, except killing dumb animals for sport, which, as far as I know, Boris Johnson has never done. King Charles collects money in banknotes, in plastic bags. Portland and Mason's plastic bags, but they are plastic bags nonetheless, from sheikhs of Arabi, from dodgy Arab billionaires. I don't know if he properly counts it or weighs it. I don't know if he pays tax on it. I don't know if he properly accounts for it. How can I? When you receive a million pounds, as revealed by the Times newspaper, a staunch royalist bastion just a few weeks ago, when you receive a million pounds in grubby banknotes from an Arab oligarch, it's not easy to be confident that that money came from a kosher place and went to a kosher place. And Diana and the plastic bag full of banknotes is not even half of the story. I repeat what I said on Sunday, you're not going to like this King Charles. First, there's his total inability to keep things in proportion, as seen on the very first day of his reign as King Charles III, when through gritted teeth, he metaphorically screamed at a hapless aide to get a little piece of plastic removed from the desk in front of him. The ugliness of that grimace, and heaven knows what kind of anger temper was displayed behind the scenes, if that's how he behaves in front of the cameras, was merely a harbinger of things to come. CNN captured some of the most extraordinary footage of King Charles's reign so far, though I promise you there'll be much more to come when his pain was not to his satisfaction. He stormed away in front of flunkies and flumeries. He stormed away talking about this happens every stinking time. I suppose we should be grateful that uh, the expletive was not worthy of deletion. This was all over the fact that he himself had put the wrong date. But odd for a man that really ought to know how many days he is into his reign. Put the wrong date on a piece of paper and then his pen smudged. And he wanted to blame somebody, anybody. I thought Camilla was going to get it in the neck. And let me turn to Camilla. Everyone is obsequiously calling her the Queen Consort. 
I will not. I will not forget the fact that she was a willing party to the destruction of Princess Diana. I will not forget the way in which a married woman herself with many children ruthlessly cavorted her way back into the affections of then Prince Charles and on to a seat as the Queen Consort. What does that mean, Queen Consort? The last Queen Consort, I recall, was Mrs. Wallace Simpson, a man of equally colourful morals. And we know how that ended up. I could go through them all, but I want to turn to why you'll regret King Charles, not just for these reasons I've given but for his political views. Now, I met the Queen a couple of times. I have no idea about her political views. I suspect, believe, that they were boilerplate, run-of-the-mill, Daily Mail, conservative political views. But the point that I don't know what her political views are is the point, because Queen Elizabeth was the very soul of discretion. She didn't go around letting it be known what she thought on the great issues of the day. Not so, Charles, and if you think he's going to stop that, you've got another think coming. Charles's quackery and greenery is going to drive you mad. He is a bosom buddy of Klaus Schwab, of the World Economic Forum, which wants us all to own nothing and promises us we'll be happy nonetheless. The fact that Schwab owns plenty and Charles owns plenty more doesn't matter. It's you, the plebs, that are going to have to own nothing. It's you, the plebs, that are going to have a cashless society within the next five years, although I suspect cash in plastic Fortnum and Mason's bags will continue to change hands at the top of society. It's you who will be beggared by this quackery and greenery in which Charles wholeheartedly believes. All kinds of newspapers and magazines have been hailing Charles as the climate king. That's right. He's a courtier at the feet of the throne of the real queen, Greta Thunberg, the 15-year-old schoolgirl who seems to make environmental policy and energy policy for just about every government in the Western world. Charles is a devotee, as loyal as any devotee to any guru in any ashram, anywhere in any Himalayan, Hilton, he worships the ground that Greta Thunberg walks upon. He believes that in the teeth of this overwhelming economic collapse that we are facing, we must double down. We must put our foot on the accelerator that we can't afford now to press in the direction, ineluctable direction of net zero, of climate zero. This kind of apocalyptic politics is very much King Charles. You're not going to like it. I promise you that. He's only been there a few days and I've filled 13 minutes with criticisms of him. Every one of them well-founded. Every one of them now in the public domain. What about in three weeks, three months, three years from now? What about in 25 years from now? Because he's 73 and he's got his first job. But he might live till he's 93 if he's as lucky as his late mother. He might live until he's 100 if he's as lucky as his late father. His luck will be your bad luck because he will be your head of state, however badly he performs, however unpopular he becomes, you can do 
nothing about it. He is your head of state. Now, what kind of a country? Never mind the seventh biggest economy in the world. We were overtaken in the week by India. We're now the seventh biggest in the world. Give it a year or two, we'll not even be in the G7. No, Italy is in the G7 and its economy is not that great. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization has nine members. It represents more than half the population of the world and it represents more than half the national wealth in the world. And when Saudi Arabia joins and joins after Iran joins at the next meeting and other countries join like Argentina and Brazil starts to play a role in the BRICS, in the Shanghai organization, you're going to see a complete rebalancing in the world. And we will be stuck with a quack, with a green-fingered king that talks to the trees. And it's going to drive you mad. But as I said, even if none of the foregoing was true, even if Charles was a good egg, I would still be saying it's in demeaning to Britain, degrading to Britain, that we cannot be a grown-up country and that millions of our people, I think it's fair to say millions of our people, appear to have lost their minds. They're in a miasma of grief over someone they never knew, never met, and to whom they paid billions of pounds over the last 70 years. They laugh at the North Koreans, but every electronic billboard in this country, from Land's End to John O'Groats, and I include bus stops, at the foot of which sit homeless, poverty-stricken people, is covered 24-7 with portraits of the late leader. What's the difference? between this kind of monography here in Britain and that which we laughed at in North Korea. Even I laughed at it in North Korea. I twice visited uh, the mausoleum of the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung. And the very second that people walked into the air-conditioned room and saw his embalmed body in a glass case, the very second they began weeping. Even people that I'd been with the last time who'd worked at exactly the same point then. I thought, this must be an Eastern thing. It's definitely not a communist thing. It must be an Eastern thing. It must be a Korean thing. But it turns out not. It turns out to be a thing where consent has been manufactured by those in control of the means of production of consent. That's what brings it. When you are effectively brainwashed, you will respond to any Pavlovian signal in the way that the rich and the powerful and the people in control of your life want you to respond. Ask yourself this. Have you seen an Armenian twibbon yet? Armenia was illegally and violently invaded by Azerbaijan, which is the twin of the NATO member, Turkey. This week, you hear much about it. You hear much about the Armenian civilians that were killed. Did you hear anything about the inviolability of borders and frontiers, the unacceptability of armies penetrating the borders of neighboring countries? Did you hear any of that? Of course, you did not. Nobody's queuing up to help Armenia. Only Russia and the other members of the CSTO will come to the aid of Armenia. Nobody else will do so. You think there'll be fundraising for Armenia? 
Do you think the Eiffel Tower will turn into a display of the Armenian flag? Do you think all the football grounds will be done up in the colors of Armenia? Of course they will not, because they have no interest amongst the powerful in manufacturing your consent for support, let alone going to war for Armenia. Ditto Yemen, ditto Gaza, ditto a hundred other places where suffering has been intense for decades, half a century, 70 years and more. No one wants to manufacture your consent for action to defend the disinherited Palestinian people, the illegally annexed old city of Jerusalem, the illegally annexed Golan Heights, which belong to Syria. Nobody wants your consent for any of these things. They are very careful about what they manufacture consent for. And being ruled in Britain by a dysfunctional, multiply divorced, adulterous, lecherous, perhaps even in one case criminally so, family is what they intend. And it works. Propaganda works, especially over a very long period. And that's why millions of my compatriots are lining the streets uh, to say goodbye to the Queen and will lustily sing, I have no doubt, God save the King. Whether they'll still be singing that 12 months from now, as I said, is an open question. Now, a lot of people say to me, well, rather King Charles than President Boris Johnson or President Tony Blair. Well, marginally, perhaps. But that's not the dichotomy. You don't have to have an executive president like France. You can have a figurehead titular president like Germany. Tell me the name of the president of Germany. None of you know who the president of Germany is unless you're watching me from Germany and perhaps not even then. You can have a president that is elected by the parliament or elected by all the regional assemblies and councils. You can have a parliament, a president that may not be someone previously involved in politics. You could have a president who has to be a person uh, with an unpaid record of work in in good things, good work, you can have all kinds of presidents. I'm not in favor of a President Boris Johnson or a President Tony Blair, although President George Galloway might not be a bad thing, but that's not the kind of republic I'm talking about. I believe in parliamentary government, though we do need to do away with the unelected half of our parliament, namely the House of Lords. That's an aberration, just as absurd as monarchy itself. In fact, these two things are indissolubly linked. We should have a democratic parliament, and it should be sovereign. It should make the rules. A democratic parliament elected on a fair voting system, not one in which you can poll a million, even two million votes, and not win a single seat in Parliament. I'm talking about a radical overhaul of Britain's democracy. And I believe that the demand for a referendum on our democratic future, including the future of the monarchy, is a demand whose time, if not come, is coming. And I believe that in my own lifetime, if I live a normal span, that that demand will become unstoppable. I will not go quietly into the good night of deference uh, to a king and a royal family for whom I have 
No respect. Someone asked me the other day, show some respect. For whom? For Charles? The bad man? For Camilla? The bad lady? For Prince Andrew? No, I don't respect them. And one thing you know about me, or you wouldn't be here. I don't fake it. If I don't feel grief, if I don't feel fealty, I will not fake it. I have been denounced this week on social media in the most vicious terms, seeking to demand that I indulge in performative grief. I will not do it. As I said to you, I kneel only before God. My queen is Mary, Maria. My king is Jesus. I don't regard any other man or woman in this country as any better a human being than anyone else. At least they were not created so. If by a lifetime of good work they have earned my respect, they will get that respect. But it will not be uncritical. It will not be without qualification. It cannot be. And so, I say again, as I come to the end of this monologue, that whilst I have nothing bad to say about the Queen, I told her when I met her in Buckingham Palace, Your Majesty, I served you once before I became a member of Her Majesty's most loyal opposition in Parliament. As a matter of fact, I was on the governing side then, but I spent most of my near 30 years in Parliament, in the opposition, whether my party was in government or not. She said, really? Were you in the services? I said, no, but I did serve you as a wine waiter at an event in the Angus Hotel in Dundee, and you posed me my then most difficult dilemma of my young life. How so, she asked. I told her, I asked you, Red or white, your majesty, and you answered, yes, please. What did you do? She asked. I poured white, I said. You did the right thing, said her majesty. I have no bad feelings about her, but she's gone now. May God have mercy upon her soul, and may she rest in peace. But I will not transfer my feelings to Charles because he happened to be the first born child with balls in Her Majesty's family. If Princess Anne had been first born, she could not have been the heir to the throne, even though she's infinitely to be preferred to Charles for that job. Now they've changed that. But one thing they haven't changed is that Catholics are not wanted on the voyage. And if anything would have turned me off about the so-called ascension, dig the word, ascension? It's Jesus that had an ascension, not Charles. The ascension ceremony required every privy councillor present, and they didn't have to be present, Nicola Sturgeon, the leader of the SNP, which rests on hundreds of thousands of Catholic votes in Scotland, did not have to go there and sign her name to a declaration of Protestant supremacy in Britain, a union, and to King Charles III, but she volunteered to do so. I wonder how that's going to go down at Celtic Park, where they appear to have had a more or less mass conversion to the cause of Scottish nationalism, where once you could not have found a Scottish nationalist anywhere in the stadium. Maybe when they find out that Nicola Sturgeon signed an anti-Catholic proclamation this week, and when they find out inexplicably that Alex Salmond went all the way to London to sign it too, Alex Salmond, 
went all the way to London to sign it too, maybe it'll be a plague on both their houses, the SNP and ALBA, which is Alex Salmon's party, which is a break away from the SNP. He thought when he gave it that name that it was Gaelic for Scotland, but in fact, it's Gaelic for Britain. ALBA, ALBA, Albion, Albion. Britain. You've got to laugh. Make a horse laugh, actually. Okay, I've spoken for long enough. Let's see what the audience uh, makes of it. Charles K says, anti-Catholics are still around. You bet. Uh, Charlie would refer to me as a sooty, says Prank Star. I'll not probe that. I think what you're saying is you're of a dusky hue, like my own children are. Uzi One Millimeter says, what's up with all the fish surnames in the SNP? Something fishy about it, that's for sure. Uh, Ansgar Sarkaryasan says, show for the peasants, right? Like a football game, right? And Guni, 1972. These are going too fast for me, whoever is controlling the speed, which can only be Gayatri, as there's only her and me here. Uh, Edward Goring says, Catholic, can we keep this diatry on the screen? I don't want to do a King Charles here, but every time I start to read one, it disappears. Uh, Sean Bebbington, I'm going to stop reading them and read them on the screen. Pafstal Jat says, North Korean ruler would be happy to see the current happening in England. I'm not sure, but... Uh, it's certainly a very North Korean atmosphere in the country. Eduardo Salgado Reyes says, if we didn't believe in any God, the divine right to rule would be a much simpler affair to debate. What say you? Well, I do believe in God, so I have to have that debate. And if you think that God chose King Charles III, well, there's nothing. I can do for you. Let's see what else there is. I seem to have frozen on the screen. I hope you can all still hear me, even though I'm not moving. Uh, okay, I can't get any messages up. Uh, Gadri, it's saying uh, reload or cancel. What should I do? I'm back, I hope, I think. Uh, apologies, we were having technical difficulties. I told you it was mom and pop TV, no budget television. Wait till the 12th of October when the all singing, all dancing, mother of all talk shows is back. Trump 24 is unstoppable, says Kingsley. Now, we've got a poll running. Thousands of people have voted on it. Is Donald Trump about to be indicted, if Gayatri can get me the latest uh, polling on that, uh, it's relatively close. But the fact that so many people have responded to it seems to indicate that it's a very live issue. I personally believe that he is about to be indicted. That doesn't mean he's going to be convicted. It's not about that. It's performative. It is to influence the midterm elections just a few weeks away. It's to try and put Trump out of the presidential race because the Democrats and the oligarchy that they represent are actually terrified of Donald Trump because they know that he would defeat them. Now that path is fraught with many perils, including the ultimate peril of armed clashes, 
even civil war too in the United States. After all, if you quite clearly criminalize through lawfare a person who wants to run for president because you know that he's going to win, do you expect his supporters to roll over tamely and accept that? How absurd is that? Uh, let's see if there's any more uh, messages. Uh, ben Kavanagh gives $5. Thanks, Ben. Climate alarmism is at the heart of the Great Reset. Time for a proper debate about it on Kali Mahorra. What do you think, George? I think it's a good idea, Ben. I'll uh, see if I can uh, influence uh, those who choose the subjects. We had a very good Kali Mahorra. I went out tonight on NATO. Do catch it on YouTube uh, after this show. Uh, CKZCKW. The soap opera of the mainstream media constantly attacking Harry and Meghan is an intentional distraction from the pedo pedophile prince. I presume you mean Andrew, uh, not Philip. They are sacrificial lambs, but we will not forget. I couldn't care uh, less about any of them, to be honest. Um, uh, Lille speaks. Monarchy should be abolished in the 21st century. You're right, brother. Uh, I'm amazed that we've even got to argue that point. It's the infantilization of the British people that they need some kind of medieval ruler to keep them on the straight path. It's perfectly absurd. Uh, Robert West gives £20. Thanks, Robert. What's you over the years, you being baited and taunted by the media, by the likes of Paxman and Morgan, with no real airtime given for adequate response? How magnificent to see you with massive numbers on social media. Sweet revenge. Thanks, Robert. I'm glad you noticed uh, my audience dwarfs the audience of Piers Morgan. And uh, Jeremy Paxman's no longer with us, of course, but his heirs and successors, I don't mean he's passed away, uh, I mean that he's no longer uh, working in television. I at least had respect for Paxman, not so much for his heirs and successors at the BBC. Uh, ben again says, Charles is at the heart of the Great Reset. He is a harbinger of doom. Hopefully it's the doom of the capitalist class. There's a powerful argument uh, made by Brendan O'Neill, the editor of Spiked Online, uh, that uh, Charles is indeed a harbinger of doom. I commend it uh, to you. I agreed with almost all of it, but not quite. Uh, let's see what else there is. Chris Donner. Just dropped your contribution, George. See you in Stockport for Moats soon. Love to you and Gayatri and the family. That's Chris Turner, the Bolshevik beekeeper. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. See you at the Stocky show. It's in the Garrick Theatre. But I've got to tell you, <laughs> this is no exaggeration. There's only three dozen seats left out of uh, 151. So it's a small theatre, 151 seats were available only 36 are left so and it's not until november so nearly two months out it is almost sold out so if you're going i really uh would advise you to get your tickets very quickly i appear to have frozen again with both of my eyes closed uh tanya keen says their harry and megan issue is not about skin color it's about not paying the IRS in the USA. So Harry's children won't get titles or they will have to pay USA tax. Winds are not giving their secrets away. Well, you know more than me, uh, Tanya, as I don't deal in princes and princesses myself, although my little girl, Orla, thinks she's a princess, intends to make it as a princess, her idol is neither Catherine nor Meghan, but Rapunzel, an altogether more wholesome princess, I think. Uh, Ange, 
2099 says, can I get a refund from the monarchy as I need it to pay gas and electric? That's a very good point. We're paying to heat Buckingham Palace. Shouldn't we be able to go in it and see it when we like? Having been in it, I've got to tell you, it's pretty boring. Carol Hope gives five pounds. Thank you, Carol. You give me hope every week with your kindness and generosity. Uh, how am I doing? Plenty of time. Eric Suarez gives five US dollars. Thank you, Eric. Assange's family is in Mexico and will be part of Independence Day. I wish you could have been invited as well, sir. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm too busy to go to Mexico, but my heart is always with AMLO's uh, sterling efforts on behalf of Julian Assange. Of all the leaders in the world, he speaks about Julian more than any other. And Mexico uh, has a special place in my heart, though it's many years since I have been there. Uh, let's see what else. Mourns Lad says, it's amazing how many British citizens are falling over themselves to pay homage and exalt another person no better than them. That's true. Uh, but for someone my age, uh, I've got a green screen behind me. Uh, the Queen was my green screen. She was in my life uh, for every single day of that life. That's why I found the Netflix series, The Crown, uh, so uh, enthralling, gripping, because it was the soundtrack of my life. It was the newsreel that I had watched throughout my life. So it's understandable that it is a wrench, but it's so over the top. And the, the, the monography of it has extended to arresting someone in Edinburgh for shouting at Prince Andrew that he shouldn't be there. When I've just shouted through this screen to you that he shouldn't be there. Are they going to arrest me? What kind of a society have we become? We're holding up a blank placard with nothing on it. Got a barrister huckled by the police outside Downing Street in Whitehall because they feared what he might write upon it. I mean, this, this would be horrific if it wasn't hilarious. It's so utterly ridiculous, it is beyond words. And by the way, the so-called Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, backed the police, arresting both the person who shouted about the Epstein connection to Prince Andrew and supported the police arresting a man with a blank piece of paper. I would have thought that blank was Keir Starmer's favorite color. But there you go. Let's see. Uh, Ian Woody Woodwoof. Camilla is, was a mean rider. That's one reason she has that equine look. Well. As my good wife is sat not five feet from me, I really shouldn't respond to that. Paul McCord says the mourning period is being used to brainwash people into being subservient to the elite. I do think it shows, Paul, that the whole show is unstable. We've got a prime minister elected by a tiny handful of people in the Conservative Party who not to put too fine a point on it, is thick. We've got a head of state elected by no one, which even the last three days demonstrate that he is not his mother. He has none of the grace and restraint and good manners uh, of his mother. He is ready to snarl and snap over a fountain pen. Let's hope he never has to deal with a real crisis. You know what I mean? Uh, David Ockness says, Sorry, Gigi, Charles is just using Greta along with the rest of the 1% who connived her entire public image. Greta is a setup by the billionaires of Davos, including Charles and Schwab and the WEF. Absolutely. I take your point. She's just a kid. Uh, she looks like a, a Manchurian candidate kid. 
that's been programmed by somebody else. I'll grant you that. But she's a useful uh, cipher, if you like, uh, for the elite, the Davos, W-E-F, Bilderberg elite. I thought I'd find myself talking in these terms, but increasingly it's difficult not to. Let's see what else there is. Still got 15 minutes, Gayatri. Dude T says slavery, protection, and monopoly find defenders not only in those who profit by them, but in those who suffer by them. Frederick Bastiat. Well said, uh, dude. I saw a couple of great quotes today, one by John Maynard Keynes. Uh, Capitalism requires you to believe uh, that the nastiest men in the world engaged in the nastiest practices in the world, can somehow be trusted together to act in the common good. As a definition of the monopoly capitalism that we enjoy, I thought it was pretty good. And the other was, of course, even more famous and long-standing. And it was by the great Antonio Gramsci, written in prison, when he said, in the 1930s, under fascism, when fascism ruled the roost in Italy, in Germany, and in Japan. But the old world is dying. The new world is struggling to be born. We are in the time of monsters. True in the 1930s, true in 2022. Let's see what else we've got. Ben again says, in every direction, net zero is a way to take things away from the workers. Yes. Take away your meat, take away your car, take away your heat, take away your lifespan, take away your children. I will not allow myself or my children to be subject to a takeaway. Uh, I would uh, starve myself rather than eat insects. Put that on your plate and eat it. Lou is, says Truss and Charles, the dynamic duo of the UK's doom. I think that's so well put. Did you imagine that the country, when last existentially challenged in the summer of 1940, until the Easter of 1941, that was led by Winston Churchill and Clement Attlee, and Ernest Bevan would end up, when existentially challenged in 2022, ruled by Goofy and Liz Truss. Did you? Uh, Let's see what else we've got. Uh, Conrad VFR, uh, 750, I think that's A donation, is it? No, that's just a title. A president, George Galloway, would improve the UK's reputation in the world significantly. Thank you very much, Conrad. Monarchies are remembered by many countries as the UK's colonial past. It's hard not to. The crown you're going to see on Charles's head on Monday is stolen property. The biggest diamond on it is the Kohenor stolen from India. The second biggest diamond on it, the Africa star, as the name suggests, was stolen from Africa, from South Africa, to be precise. If they returned all the stolen jewels out of King Charles's new crown, it would be like one of these Christmas hats that you put on at your Christmas dinner to pull your crackers. There'll be nothing of value left on it. You feel me? Let's see. Uh, Geraldine Clifford gives 10 American dollars. Thank you, Geraldine. You're right, George. It's just about moving Trump out of the way. It's quite an admission, though, Geraldine. They sent the FBI to raid the home of a former president of the Republic for the first time in their history. They are, in my opinion, preparing to indict, criminally indict, a former president of the Republic for the first time, and only because they know that he will beat them in a presidential election 
If they don't, what an admission of weakness that is by the so-called Democrats. Abiding 71 gives 99 cents. Thank you for that, my friend. Don't be embarrassed about giving $1, one pound, one euro. Uh, Orang Kiani gives five British pounds. Thank you very much indeed. Kiani Sab, I appreciate it. George, what do you think Alex Belfield will be sentenced to on Friday? Prison or community service? That's uh, from Frederick K. I'm struggling with who Alex Belfield is. Someone will give me inspiration, I'm sure. Uh, on that, so I can't answer it. Sorry. Edward Goring says Catholic charities have saved billions during famines. Uh, now the GLBTY are trying to tell governments they can't use them no more. Do you mean the LGBTQ plus plus minus Y? I think that's what you mean. Well, uh, more fool governments if they don't. But uh, given you've got to sign an oath to attend an ascension ceremony in, in London to shout, God save the king. You've got to sign an oath that you will uphold Protestant supremacy. Nothing would surprise me. Let's see uh, where we are. Uh, still got 10 minutes left. Uh, okay, so here's the poll numbers on Twitter. Uh, when I asked the question, is President Trump going to be indicted? On Twitter, 928 people uh, voted. Yes, said 35%. No, said 65%. That is interesting. But on the YouTube community, where thousands of people have voted, there's a slightly different emphasis. Telegram, 512 people voted. 43% said, yes, Trump is going to be indicted. Only 57% thought that he was not. Uh, on the YouTube show, that's those of you watching live now, 1,004 people voted. 39% of you think he is going to be indicted and 61% of you think he is not going to be invited. But the YouTube community, which was by far and away the biggest uh, voting number, I don't have yet. But when I do, I'll give it to you. Uh, that's the uh, live number, I think, because several thousand people voted on community earlier in the evening. Okay, any more uh, questions? Trilby or Fedora, George, says Emma Williams. Well, the only, the only jeans are Levi's, and the only hats are fedoras. I've been in love with the fedora hat since black and white TV in the late 60s and early 70s. The Untouchables, Elliot Ness and his men wearing fedoras. I've loved fedoras ever since. I'd never wear a trilby. I wouldn't suit it. I'd look like a bookie. Although as I once said to someone, I'd look like a bookie and they answered, what is a bookie looky? Uh, it's certainly not a looky I want. Uh, okay, here's the uh, YouTube community number. 5,300 people voted on that. 32% thought that Trump was about to be indicted and 68% thought that he was not. So, I don't know, that's the best part of 10,000 uh, people have voted. Certainly 8,000 uh, people have voted this evening and I'm, I'm grateful to you for that, especially on a Champions League night when we all had to drag ourselves away from the television. Hugh McNaught gave £17.99. Thanks, Hugh. Always jaw-dropping lessons from the ranter-in-chief. You are a true worthy. Thanks, I think, Hugh. Ranta, what? Uh, ben gives 10 US dollars. Did you see the NUJ motion for the TUC conference? Now, for younger viewers, I should explain what these acronyms mean. NUJ means National Union of Journalism. TUC means Trades Union Congress. The motion was titled Global Attacks on Journalism. It mentioned Shireen Abouakli, Dom Phillips, threats to UK journalists, 
that doesn't mention Assange. Shame on them, Ben. Shame, shame, shame on them. Uh, I'm, I'm gobsmacked. I'm speechless uh, to learn that. Every day is a school day. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. Terry Fantastic says, Alex Belfield is on the level of Katie Hopkins, David Icke. He got accused of bullying BBC employees, including Jeremy Vine. He defended himself and lost. Big ego, potty mouth, hoped he would win, though. Doesn't sound like my sort of chap. Uh, so we'll just wait and see what happens to him. Potty mouth, huh? Uh, Aaron Ngo gives 20 Australian dollars. Most generous, Aaron. Thank you very much indeed. This is for the fighting fund to relaunch the midweek moats on the 12th of October. Make a date with me that day. Uh, we've still got four minutes left, so let's run through more. Metho Nelson gives 20 US dollars. With all due respect, Mr. Galloway, on the issues of whether or not the late Queen should be held responsible for the atrocities committed by the crowd. I think you're drunk on the Kool-Aid. She hasn't apologized. Well, I've never been drunk and neither will I ever drink Kool-Aid. And I'm not normally, especially this week, accused of being an apologist for the Crown. As someone from an Irish background, that would be a very difficult allegation to sustain. The Crown's crimes against the world in the days of our empire, so vast that upon it the sun never set, because God would never trust us in the dark, are so vast that nobody could apologize for them. And what would an apology mean? You apologize when you stand on someone's toe. You don't apologize for dragging them from the lands of Africa, putting them in chains and shipping them through the middle passage to live out their lives as beasts of burden, as slaves. No apology cuts in those circumstances. You can't apologize for the crimes of empire in Africa, in Asia, in Ireland, in the Middle East, in Aden, in Palestine, you can't apologize for these things. Most of them took place before the last queen was born. She could not be held responsible for things done by her ancestors, of course. But you miss the point. You miss this most important point. That for 150 years at least, arguably for 300, the king or the queen does not rule Britain. The government rules Britain. When the royal family go somewhere, they go there because the government told them to go there. When they are, they say what the government tells them to say. So that government was at least for a hundred years nearly, since the women got the vote in 1929, that government was elected by us, the British people. We cannot wash our hands of it. We cannot say not in my name because it was in our name, on our dime, and with our votes as a people. So should we all apologize? Should everyone involved in electing the governments that oppressed the people of Kenya in the Queen's reign, the people of Yemen in the Queen's reign, the people of the north of Ireland during the Queen's reign, should we all apologize for that? Because we elected the government that told her to order her troops and other dispositions in a certain way in those places. She's gone now. Stop holding her accountable for things that happened before she was born. Hold our government accountable. 
Want to know the biggest crime committed in the Queen's reign? It was the invasion and occupation of Iraq. It killed a million people and sent ISIS and Al-Qaeda cascading around the world. And cascade, they still do. That's the biggest crime that was committed during the Queen's reign. You're going to blame the Queen for it? Or are you going to blame the Labour Party for it? Because it was their leader and his cabinet and his MPs that did it. You see how foolish that is? I'm going to take one more uh, because I gave such a long answer there. Um, Pat Brannigan says, well, you become what you criticize. You become what you adore. Whatever you focus on grows in your experience. Alan Cohen. We have criticized the Chinese. Our society is becoming like theirs. Oh, Pat, if only it were. We're on our way to being a banana republic with a guy with a crown sitting in the top chair. It's been marvellous. Thanks for joining me on The Galloway Show. Join me again on Sunday at 7 p.m. UK time for the mother of all talk shows. Good night.